So today is a new month, the month of November, and we're starting on a new focus, which is allegiance. Allegiance simply just means loyalty, loyal or committed or faithful. Okay? And today I've entitled my message as Everlasting Fidelity. Okay? So before we start, I just want to pose a question to all of you here as lifeliners. When I ask you that no matter whatever happens, will you still hold on to this gospel truth? Will you still hold on to the light, the source that is in you, that is shining forth in your life? And we must always go back to that question. Daily, we need to have a pause in our life and ask us, that question, will we still hold on to this faith and the gospel truth of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection? Because as we grow up, as we grow into different stages of life, different things might happen uh, in your work, in your relationship, whatever it is, there is a change in life. We will not be stagnant. But during that change, no matter whatever happens, we will still hold on to that faith. And that is allegiance itself. Allegiance to the gospel truth, allegiance to God himself. Okay? And as Lifeline leader, and I hope and it's my heart's desire for all of us as a united body of Christ to be able to declare and proclaim that, yes, I will, because God is the one that gives me strength and the power to hold on to this faith. And in the first place, God is the one that gives me that grace and that mercy to be able to receive the gospel truth itself. And it's by God's grace and mercy that today we are able to stand firm in this truth. Okay? And through the focus allegiance, today I just want to highlight on, I think some of us might be familiar with the story of the seven churches in Revelation chapter, you can say one, two, and three. And here we can clearly see what is it that we ought to be cautioned of and what we ought to hold fast. Because it's very subtle, because you can see in all the seven churches, it's actually a minor, minor thing. But that is the one that is causing them to deviate from the initial faith that they hold on to. Okay? So let me go to my first point, which is love and truth. Let me read in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. It says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. So from the first which is written, it says that, yes, God has commanded them that they are hardworking and they have patiently endured and they do not tolerate evil people. Okay, so before going there, in verse 1, it says that the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands, those uh, are written in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, 13, and also 16. You can go back and read. So here, what is the complaint about? It's complaint about that they have no love even though they have the truth, but they have forgotten their first love. The love that actually draw them to this gospel truth. Because always when this gospel goes forth, it goes forth with love and truth. And today, we also must examine in ourselves that do we have 
God's love in us. Our first love of this gospel, the excitement, that passion that came with that gospel, the power and the anointing that came with that gospel, that love that you had for that gospel, has it slowly been deteriorating? Because it says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 to 7, it says, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possesses all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoice whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstances. So only when we have experienced Christ's love in us, then we can love others. But daily, uh, we must experience Christ's love moment by moment. Because the love and truth, if we say that we believe in the gospel truth, that means you're believing that God loves you every single moment of your life. And because you have been united with that love of God, that is why we can show forth love to others. Because there is no point, like what uh, Paul has written, there is no point if I have all the knowledge, if I possess all the knowledge of God, but I do not love the others or if I can help the poor, but I do not love them. So in all of it, God sees the heart's intention. Do we really, are we doing it out of a love for another person or another soul, another spirit? Or are we just doing it because somebody says so? Because this is a good deed. I want to show forth. And when we show forth any good deed with our own strength, not Christ's love in us, then we are the one boasting that because I am able to supply to that person. That is why I'm doing that. So, but if the intent of your heart is out of God's love, then all glory will go back to Him. That is why it's very important when we are living on this side of this world, God's love and truth must always abide in us. And when we show forth to others, it will always be God's love and truth together because love and truth goes hand in hand. It does not separate, okay? And in Romans 13, verse 8 to 10, it says, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say, you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirement of God's law. So here, it's also Paul writing that. He says that your obligation is to love one another. Because God has loved us, and our obligation today, there is a burden in our heart to show forth that love to others as well. So today, let us also... As we have come back to church, let us also be recalled of this gospel truth and God's love that we have first believed in. Amen? Going to my second point is faithful. Let us see in Revelation 2 verse 8 to 11, it says, the message to the church in Simna. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Simna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last who was dead but is now alive. And this is written in Revelation 1, verse 8, 5, 17, and 18 as well. So in verse 9, it says, I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you, you will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. 
Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. Amen. So here it says to be faithful amidst persecution. And I think we have seen in the life of Paul mainly, and also all the disciples itself, that throughout any persecution, they were faithful because they know and they have the assurance that this gospel is the truth and God is true himself. That is why in hardship, in persecution, no matter what they have gone through, they still hold on to this faith and stand firm in it. Amen? So let us see in Hebrews 10 verse 23, it says that, So let us cease and hold fast and retain, without wavering the hope we cherish and confess, and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. And because God is so faithful that today is not because of our own strength that we're able to be faithful to this gospel truth, but it's because God is the one that is giving us, empowering us so that we're able to stand firm in this gospel truth, to be faithful. And in the parable of the talent that I think Jeremy has also preached before, so in Matthew 25 verse 21 it says, his master said to him, Well done, you upright, honourable, admirable, and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of much. Enter into and share the joy, the delight, the blessedness which your master enjoys. So here is saying about the servant. When the master have gave them that talent, they invested it. And today, when God has given us talents in our life, are we faithful to it? And are we investing it? When God has placed that gospel in you, are we growing in that gospel truth? Are we taking a step forward to know more of God? And God is the one that is giving us that strength and that empowerment so that we're able to move forward and sprint forth in this gospel truth so that many more is able, are able to know this gospel itself. Okay? And here it says, those who are faithful amidst persecution will not be harmed by the second death. And in every single one of it, God promised those who are victorious, those who might have gone astray but repented, they're able to be victorious. In every part in the first point, love and truth, they are able to eat from the fruit from the tree of life, which is partaking everlasting life, that they are able to be in paradise with God. Okay, and my third point is doctrine. So in Revelation 2 verse 12 to 17, it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamon. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Okay, here in Revelation 1 verse 16, it also is written that the one with the sharp two-edged sword. And if we recall in Hebrews 4 verse 12, it also says that for the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, soul, and the immortal spirit, and of joints and marrow of the deepest part of our nature, exposing and shifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purpose of the heart. So that is the power of the word of God. And that power is the one that power itself is speaking forth. Okay, so let us go back to our text. In verse 13, it says, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone 
and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. So here, the complaint was about them tolerating. Yes, they were loyal, but some of them have tolerated the teachings of Balaam and uh, also the Nicolaitans. So here, Balaam, if you read back in the Old Testament, he says that he is more of profit. Anything with profit, he will do. And a uh, lead of idol worshippers and also the Nicolaitans is drawing them away from the truth and all about idol worshipping. So it's deviating them from God himself. Okay? And here it simply means that sometimes we, not, we might not be, oh, I've created a stone and worship a stone or anything like that. But sometimes we, as a born again elect, yes, we might portray as loyal to this gospel truth, but sometimes we still tolerate and conform to the pattern of this world. There is many things in life, like I said just now, all of this in the seven churches, it might be a minor, minor thing, but that minor, minor thing is the one that caused some of them to deviate from this truth. Okay, so here is some of them who have believed in this gospel are conforming to the pattern of this world. And it also reminds us that in Paul, in Romans 12, verse 2, it says that do not be conformed to this pattern, this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourself what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in His sight for you. So here, I know we have uh, heard this passage of Scripture many of times, but it reminds us that Today, once we are born of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, that means from that mud that we have been in, which is sin itself, we have been saved so wonderfully. We have been drawn out from that mud because when we believe that Christ, when John the Baptist represented all mankind to take the whole world's sin and pass it upon Jesus, Jesus is the one that took all of our sins at his baptism. And because they have taken all our sins, he needs to die for us. And at the cross, he has paid it in full, once and for all. Our sin are dealt with. So we are sinless. And when Christ has resurrected, today we are declared righteous because the Holy Spirit resides in us. That is why we can say that we are a living testimony. The light shines forth. That, and that is why when we are brought out of that mud and we have been cleansed by the gospel truth, let us not go back to that mud again, to conform to the pattern of this world. Because when we're conforming to the pattern of this world, you're slowly going down or degrading back to where first you came out of. So today, as the Bible has written that in Romans 12 verse 2, we must daily transform, be transformed in the renewal of our minds. Because our minds and our actions, some things that we have done or we might be doing, it might drag us down, but God is saying that I have done it once and for all. I have saved you once and for all. I've cleansed all of your sin once and for all. That is why today we need to be renewed in our mind. To How do we renew our mind? It's only by reminding that God has done it. This gospel truth has set me free. Free once and for all. It's never going to drag you down anymore. Only this world will drag us down. That is why we need to hold forth and hold firm to this gospel truth so that we're able to know what is the good and the perfect will of God. Amen? And here it says that because they are morally compromising, for those who believe in Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, we cannot compromise what is said in the Bible because the Bible is the truth. And that truth goes forth with love. Some I think uh, Jeremy or Pastor might have mentioned it again and again. Love has many languages, and that is God's love for us as well. The, God, the Bible itself from the beginning, from Genesis up to Revelation, is God's love for us. And we need to take it 
that God is teaching us. God is helping us to grow further in His truth, to grow more and more like Christ. Amen? And it says that those who are victorious, they will be given some of the hidden manna from heaven and also that white stone. So what is this hidden manna? Today, those who have overcome, those who have renewed their mind are able to know the revelation knowledge of what the Bible says. Because without the Spirit Himself revealing it to us, we are unable to see because it is all hidden. Like how Jesus, when He came, He speak parables to the people, but to His disciples, He unveiled it to them. So today, we must walk in the Spirit, be renewed, be transformed in our minds so that when the Spirit is at work, that revelation knowledge, the Holy Spirit Himself will teach you from the beginning until the end. Whatever you do not know, the Holy Spirit Himself, the Comforter, your Counselor will teach you. Amen? And also, those who have overcome, we have that white stone. A white stone meaning that today, we are sinless and righteous. There is no more guilt in us because of that perfect salvation that Christ has given unto us. Amen? And my fourth point is, stand firm. So in Revelation 2 verse 18 to 29, it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Tyratira. This is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. And this is written in Revelation 1 verse 14 to 15. Okay? And in verse 19, it says, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance. And I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intention of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I have also a message for the rest of you in Tyratira who have not followed this false teaching, deeper truth, as they called them, depths of Satan actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my father and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Amen. So here it simply means it's similar to what we have read just now, the third one. But here it says that do not be led astray by that Jezebel. So we can see who is Jezebel. He is the wife of King Ahab. Jezebel is an idol worshipper because when King Ahab married Jezebel, She's the one that brought in all the idol worship and the worship bell and all of those. And also, she's the one that influenced others in the wrong path as well. And it's because of Jezebel, King Ahab was also the, in the Old Testament, in one case you can read that. It's because of that, King Ahab, God's anger was upon King Ahab because he was the, the evilest king in God's sight. Okay? And also, uh, if we know that Naboth, uh, the vineyard, because of Jezebel's scheme, because King Ahab wanted that vineyard so much, and because of Jezebel's scheme, he attained that vineyard, but it's because of her scheme and all of those that was done. And if we read, you can go back and read in 1 Kings 21, verse 25 to 26, it says that, King Ahab did all of those evil in God's eye because he was seduced or being led astray by Jezebel. So here in this context is, let us stand firm and hold fast, fast to this faith 
Because in Revelation 2 verse 25, it says, except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come back. So that today, we must not be led astray by any teaching or anything that is not, will not bring you to God's righteousness. So here it simply just, God is just telling us that let us hold fast, hold tightly to this gospel truth until we meet Christ face to face. Okay? And in Ephesians 6, Verse 11, it says, Put on God's whole armour, the armour of a heavy armed soldier which God supplies, that you may be able successfully to stand up against all the strategies and the deceits of the devil. So daily let us put on the full armour of God. And daily, how do we put on the full armour of God? Is by the renewing of our minds. And only when we put on the full armor of God and we go out to work when we are driving, that is why it's very important to set our minds. Before, when you enter into the car, I have that practice because, as you all know, I cannot drive, not cannot drive, but I am lack in my driving skill. So that lack in me caused me to want to rely on God because how am I uh, going to decide whether am I driving this correctly or not without anybody guiding me. So I need to rely on God. God, you guide me. God, you protect me. Am I going out? Am I coming in? You are the one who is showing me the way. You are the one who is giving me the knowledge of what should I do or how am I going to do this. So in our weaknesses, we are ought to rely on God. And when we sit in the car, that's the first thing I always do. God, I always speak to God first and proclaim that you are the one who is my guide. You are the one who is my protector. And without Christ, I cannot do this confidently because fear will start seeping in and fear itself is the one that is dragging us down. So we must always put into practice that God, you are the one is first in my life. You are my priority and I hold fast to this faith. Not because only in my weaknesses, but in my strength, I also want to surrender it unto you. Because we might think that our strength, when we do it in our own strength, we might think it's from ourselves, but God is the one that's giving us that health to serve Him in our strength as well. So all of it must go back to Him. It's all His glory. Amen? And in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 13, it says, Be alert and on your guard and stand firm in your faith your conviction respecting man's relationship to God and divine things, keeping the trust and holy fervor, born of faith and a part of it. Act like men and be courageous. Grow in strength. So here it says, be alert and on your guard because the devil comes like a roaring lion. He's not a lion, but he comes like a roaring lion to see and to seek whom he may devour. But today, if we are alert and stand on our guards, we can stand firm in that faith, in that firm foundation of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. No matter what others might say that this gospel might be not true, or it might be a cult, but in your heart, if you have that assurance, then you will not be moved, you will not be shaken, because that is your firm foundation, and you know because you have experienced the love of God. Amen? And in Philippians 1 verse 27, it says, Only be sure as citizens so to conduct yourself that your manner of life will be worthy of the good news, the gospel of Christ, so that whatever I do come and see you or am absent, I may hear this of you, that you are standing firm in united spirit and purpose, striving side by side and contending with a single mind for the faith of the glad tidings, the gospel. So here, I just want to highlight that today, we too, as lifeliners, our heart's desire is for all of us to be standing fir firm in the united spirit and purpose and striving side by side. Because as a born again and as a body of Christ, it's not good for us to pull each other down, but it is more effective if we grow and strive side by side and go in the same direction that God is leading us so that we're able to serve Him more effectively and 
as a body of Christ, we're able to glorify his name in another great level, to be able to bless others with our service. Amen? And in Galatians 5, verse 1, it says, In his freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held and snared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. So here it says that we have been set free from the slavery of this side of this world or Satan itself. But today, we are free to be able to serve God. We are, eight, we are free and liberated so that we do not want to go back to the yoke of slavery again. So that when we are holding firm to this faith, we must always remember that we have been set free and God gave us the freedom to be able to worship Him, to be able to go through His path because His path is the one that is leading us to a light. The light, if we are in darkness, we need to go out from that darkness and lead to that path of light. Amen? And last, it says, those who stand firm, those who overcome, I give them the authority. So today, we are given the authority and power as a gift. When God gives the Holy Spirit to you, you have that authority and power within you as well already. And it's not true like Jezebel. She had the authority through evil scheme. But today, God has given us the authority through, as a gift with the Holy Spirit himself. And only with that authority, we are able to lead one soul to eternal salvation and not destruction. Amen? And my fifth point is spiritually alive. Okay, In Revelation 3, verse 1 to 6, it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. This is written in Revelation 1 verse 4 and 20. And I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as an unexpected, as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Amen. God bless his word. So here it says, go back to what you heard and believe at first. So it's similar to holding fast. But when we hold fast this gospel truth, we must always check, are we spiritually alive? And how are we to be spiritually alive is only by holding fast to the gospel truth. And daily, we must go back to what you have first heard and what you have first believed. What is the one that has transformed you from an old creation to be a new creation, fresh and living today? You are able to communicate with God, our God who created every single one of us and also the whole universe. And today, we must always remember and hold fast to what we first believe in. Amen? And in Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 10, it says that once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclination of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subjected to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as an example of the incredible wealth 
of His grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all He has done for us, who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by His grace when you believe, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Amen. So today, when we read in Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 10, and when we relate it to the gospel truth of Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection, it's only as baptism we're united with Him, then it all makes sense. Because when we are united with Him, we were once dead, but today we are made alive because the Holy Spirit resides in us. And we are alive with God, to God Himself. This is not speaking of our physically, whether we're dead or alive, but it's our spirit man that today we are made alive. And when we are made alive in the Spirit, it's not by what we do or we did not do, but it's a gift of God. Because if it's by our own deeds or, or not our own deeds, then we're able to boast. Because it's because I'm this good, that is why God has given me this gospel. But it's not because of how good you are or how bad you are. God has given us the gospel truth as a free gift Himself. Amen? So that today, when we are made alive, we must always know that it is not by our works, but it's a gift of God. Only when we know that it's a gift of God, then we will appreciate. Because I know that I'm not that good, and I do not deserve all of this, but God saw me, and God has planned and purposed me. That is why today, I can be made spiritually alive. So that today I can live out that life, even though amidst tribulation on this side of this world, but God, you have overcome the world for me because I have been made alive in you and you are the one who is fighting the battles for me. Amen? And those who overcome will have white clothes and their name will be in the book of life and they are mine. And God is giving us that assurance that those who have been spiritually made alive through this gospel truth, you will be able to enter in the kingdom of God to eternity. You will be God with God to eternity. Amen? And the sixth one is press on. In Revelation 3, verse 7 to 13, this is written to the church in Philadelphia. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. This is written in Revelation 1, verse 18. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Amen. So here is calling us to press on. Yes, we hold fast to this faith, but in all situations, let us press on and move forward and fight a good fight and finish that race. Because our life as a born-again child of God is not a sprint, but a marathon. Daily, we need to believe until... Now we're still so young, right? And there is so many years ahead of us. And we never know when is Christ coming back or when is our time or when will we go back to God. But there is many more years ahead of us. And 
Only when we surrender to God, when we press on in this gospel truth, God is the one that is guiding us, leading us through. He does not promise us a bread of roses, but He promised us that He will be there for us. He will guide us through that journey. Amen? So daily let us press on. Because in the end, the crown of life is waiting for you. You will be called the citizen of heaven. Amen? And let us see in Philippians 3, verse 12 to 14. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, Paul is saying, or what I have already achieved perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possesses me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Uh, I've also preached uh, on a series on the press on, but here it's just saying that let us forget what lies behind and let us forget all that burden that's, that is pulling us down. Let us look ahead of what Christ is bringing us. God is bringing us to another level. If you acknowledge that God is in your life, He's bringing you to another level. And this year itself is that level up season. That those who have stand firm, who has hold fast to this faith and did not waver, we will press on and move along and grow to another level that God is bringing us, that many more souls will be blessed by our life. Amen? And last but not least, the seventh one is an active and a genuine faith. In Revelation 3 verse 14 to 22, it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. And this is written in Revelation 1 verse 5. So it says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Amen. So here it says that in Revelation 3 verse 18, it says that those, they must buy gold, white garment and eye ointment, right? So what does this gold simply mean? This gold means the genuine faith. And they thought they had it all, but actually they are loving both. The world, they are holding on to the world and also God. But we cannot hold on to both. We must forsake this side of this world and follow Christ. Okay? So, goal is the genuine faith as we can see in 1 Peter 1 verse 7 to 9. It says, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold through your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious and expressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your soul. Amen. So today, when we have that genuine faith and that garment is speaking about the garment of God's righteousness, that they will cover the spiritual nakedness and also the eye ointment is to cure and heal their blindness. So today, God is saying that let us not be lukewarm. 
Let us always be hot for God. Let us have that genuine and active faith. Let us always be clothed with the garment of God's righteousness, knowing that we are sinless and righteous in God's sight because He has saved us so wonderfully. And today, we can see spiritually because God has cured us and removed that veil. When He taken all our sins, died for all our sins, and given the Holy Spirit in us, He has removed that will, and today we can see Christ face to face. We're able to speak with Him. We're able to tell Him whatever that we are feeling, and He understands. He is that high priest that understands every single one of us because He has went through it worse than all of us. Amen? And here it says, like what Ali has shared as well, the faith must produce good works. Because only through that good works. We're not proving something, but through that good works, one might be saved. And that fruit of the Spirit is automatically producing. Because we are daily watering and also putting fertilizer. Okay, So daily we are feeding on the Word of God. Daily we are walking in the Spirit. And that is the food and the fertilizer and the water. And then when we grow, automatically it will produce fruit. Because those who do not produce fruit, it will be chopped off. Like a tree, if it doesn't produce fruit for 10 years, then what would the owner of the tree do? Only the leaves will keep dropping year after year. So automatically it will be, they will be chopped off. So daily as our life as a born again as well, we must produce good fruits. Good fruits because the source of that fruit is in us. And God is the one that is helping us to produce that growth food so that we are able to bless others as well. Amen? Blessed by today's message? Do leave us a comment. And don't forget to like and share our messages. For more sermons like this, do subscribe to our channel. And visit us at newcreationkl.org.my Have a blessed week ahead and see you all next week.